Charlotte Hornets fans. It is I, Darian Thomas, your host of the Trust the Buzz podcast, a part of the Believe Podcast Network. And in today's episode, I don't know if it's going to be long. I don't know if it's going to be short. I know last episode I was going to talk about uh, why I think the Hornets are better than what they are. And we may still get to that. I may push it back just for a little bit longer uh, for more offseason content. Because we do actually have some news. We have some news. The Hornets have made some moves. The owners are official. They had a press conference. Frank Nielakina, backup point guard. I mean, I guess so. RJ Hunter. I have no idea what that one is, but... Those are the two new signings and Xavier Sneed was cut. So we are going to talk about those things and let's just see where it takes us. But first, I would just like to talk about, I think we can go ahead and get into it. And I would just like to talk about the owners. So Rich Snall, Gabe Plotkin, they're officially the owners of the Charlotte Hornets, well, majority owners of the Charlotte Hornets. I think they said it was like a group of 20 people that they had uh, purchased the team. So that's cool. Uh, I I like the press conference. I think I don't know what you would look for in a press conference. I mean, of course, especially in the Charlotte Hornets case, you would want them to come out and say they would want they want to win. Um, you kind of hear their plan of the, what they want to win. They don't want to force it, which I think is a good idea. Um, they say they want to be patient. That's where it kind of gets. And eh. I, I completely understand what they meant. But we've been patient a very, very long time. And I have have just really, even in our good years, we just have not been able to have a consistent, reliable product on the floor. Because I would be lying if I said, if I'll be, yeah, I would definitely be lying if I would just say there aren't, there haven't been any good Charlotte Hornets teams. There has been. I mean, I'm thinking of what, the 2016, 2017 year? Is that the year? Yeah, I believe. It was a 2015, 2016, I don't know. But the year where we lost in seven to the Miami Heat, where we really could have went to the next round for like the first time in forever. Um, and then you also have the 2020, 2021 Charlotte Hornets. Was that 20? No, you have the 2021, 2022 Charlotte Hornets. Um, where we go 43 and 39 and then just get blown out by the Atlanta Hawks. So that 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 was a good team. Um, is there another team I can think of? No, not not in recent memory, I don't think. But still, I mean, I would be lying because those are those were two pretty good teams, in my opinion. And then um, I would even say for a period of time, the 29th, no, the 2020-2021, where we lost to the Indiana Pacers in the play-in, that team was good for a good little period. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I want to say they were like a top four in the East, and then Gordon Hayward got hurt. Gordon Hayward played a big part on that team. It you know it was still really early in Lamelo Ball's career. I think it was his rookie years or sophomore year. I don't remember the years kind of run together. I'm really bad at that. I've actually been trying to work on that. Um, because I do want to get better at just you know being able to spit that kind of information out. I'm not really good at. It. I mix it up all the time, but you know what I'm talking about. Gordon Hayward was a big part of that team, so him being injured really knocked the Hornets out of, of any chance of being good at that point. And then towards the end of the season, they kind of made a rally and got like 10th. Um, yeah, so there has been good teams. I mean, only two in recent memory, but still, we've been patient long enough. So I get what they were saying. However, I just hope patient isn't what we've been doing. Uh, hope patient is, hey, we're, we're just not looking to make any wrong moves. And I'm not going to put, oh, they said patient. So now, you know, I don't believe it. I'm not going to do that. I wait to see their actions. I mean, the first day they were officially owners after having a press conference, they cut Xavier's need and then made two moves after that. Why Andre Hunter? I don't know. Why Frank Nielakina? I also don't know. But, you know, we'll get into that later. But they made moves already. So I I, th- I think that's a good thing. Um, yeah, I mean, they said all the right things. They said they want to win. Uh, they said that, you know, they believe in local ownership. So they won't be like out in California or wherever they may be um, trying to, you know, run the team from afar. They said they will be in Charlotte. They'll be, you know, with the team often. So that's good. That's not, that's nice to hear because I do feel like it does play a role when it comes to just building culture. Um. I mean, that's really it. I, I essentially they just talked about how much they want to win. Uh, they understand how valuable basketball is to the state of North Carolina and to the Carolinas in general. So that's also something we would like to hear. Overall, I don't think they said anything wild. 
I don't think there's anything they've said to take out of context. There was no like trendy headline topics, which for me personally, I I take that I'll take that as a good thing. Um, I would hate for them to come in and just say all these crazy things like, oh, we're going to win a championship next year or something. I don't know. I don't know what the case may be. They did say they want to bring a championship to uh, Charlotte, which is completely understandable. Um, but yeah, they just seem, they really do seem excited. They really do seem like, I tr- one thing I've said on this podcast and on my YouTube channel, um, on Trust the Buzz, on hey, on you know on YouTube, so go check that out if you're if you don't know, that's where this whole podcast comes from. But one thing I've noticed is that I fit. Well, one thing I've said is that the new owners at the time, we at the time this is before they bought the team. I was saying that it would be very important for the new owners to understand. You bring success of any kind, consecutive success, consecutive success to this franchise, you will be seen as <laughs> fans will be ready to call you the best owners in the league. It, just if you could give us two back to back seasons where we make the playoffs, maybe the first year. I don't know what year that'll be. That could be this year. That could be next year, whatever. But you make the playoffs and then the following year you make the playoffs and maybe like push it to game seven or even game six or oh, God forbid win the series. But we win the series. Charlotte is going up. But um, yeah, you give us two consecutive good playoff seasons. I People will already be ready to sing your praises. And from the press conference, I hope. It's not just them saying that because they know that's what we want to hear. I'm not going to even put that in the air, really, because I don't know these guys personally. And also, we just haven't been able to, we haven't heard from them enough. Their actions, they really haven't been able to do anything uh, to even indicate which way they're leaning as far as are they going to be aggressive? They're going to be conservative. I don't know. But it seems like they want to win. And it seems like they do know that. It seems like they know we bring any kind of success to this franchise. We we got it like we we've done everything that is kind of required of us to do. And I think they understand on the business side that's going to drive sales. That's going to drive all tickets. That's going to drive all these things uh, if we just bring them success. And it sounds like that's their plan. It sounds like they I don't know what they're going to do basketball wise, but they did say that they have a good group of guys or, you know, people in general, uh, a good team to kind of put together. Uh, to help make these basketball decisions and kind of go forward and see where we can be after that. And I think that's good. I think that, you know, you put the team in place. I've said time and time again, similar to what David Tepper did uh, for the Carolina Panthers, where he's like, hey, I messed up with Matt Rule. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hire one coach, Frank Wright. I'm going to let Scott Fitter do his job. And then y'all are going to fail out the rest. And now we, the Panthers end up with probably one of the best staffs in front of it all together. Maybe one of like it's, it's, and I wouldn't say it's like that top tier, but it's one of those where the, you know, honorable mentions and, and that's okay. Considering where we went from, we went from being bottom of the league to, Oh wow. Now they're continuing to be one of the best teams or not one of the best teams, rather, but one of the, just the best uh, personnel, uh, office personnel, coaching personnel in the league. So I think that's good. I think they should apply that to the Charlotte Hornets. We'll see Mitch Kupchak and Steve Clifford are both in a contract year for their deals. I think that makes a lot of sense. I think you just let it ride out. There's no need to fire Mitch Kupchak. If anything, maybe they say at like halfway through the season, all right, depending on where the season's going, I won't put that into the air either. If the season's just going okay, I think you, I think they just ride it out and see how the season ends. But if the season's going awful or where you, it just doesn't seem like the Hornets are really going to be playing for anything, I could really see Mitch Kupchak and Steve Clifford being fired at the at midseason. Now, do is there like a financial penalty to that? I have no idea. I have no idea. If there's a financial penalty to firing them in the middle of the season, then maybe not. They might just let the contract run out. But – if they aren't or if they're just willing to bring in someone who will make moves at a trade deadline because, you know, we're going to revamp the team and maybe they do bring in somebody. I know that the assistant GM and I wish I could remember his name for the Brooklyn Nets has been someone that could potentially be the replacement GM for Mitch Kupchak when the time, you know, when the time is right. We'll see. But 
overall, I don't really expect any moves. I'm just this. I'm just spitballing here. I don't. I don't think there will be any moves. But it does. It does seem like Rich and all. Uh, is it Rick or Rich? I think it's Rich. I don't know. I'm, I'm probably I'm probably wrong on that. But either way, I think Rich Nall, Gay Plot, and I think they're going to do a good job. I really do. I feel like they I, now will. Uh, this is the thing. By good job, I just mean bring make the team successful. I think they're going to do what it takes. I think they're going to try. How about that? That's the word I'm going to say. I think they're going to try. I think it's. I think when however long they own the team, let's just say thirteen years again, like Michael Jordan. I think what is going to happen is at the end of their tenure, whenever, however long that is, you will not be able to deny that they've tried. Like with at the end of Michael Jordan's tenure, it was like at some points it was like, is this guy even trying? I mean, I know even the seasons that we had that were good, it was kind of good by luck because that Kimball Walker team that made the playoffs. That team should not have made the playoffs. They really shouldn't have. And then on top of that, they were actually a pretty good team. There's no way that should happen. The East was really weak that year. But still, um, I, there was just no way that team should have been as good as they were. And I think that had a lot to do with Steve Clifford. So, you know, shout out to Steve Clifford. But I don't think that team was built to be where they were. I think he, Steve Clifford willed that team. Kimball Walker willed that team. And then obviously who knew Jeremy Lin was going to play the way he did. Courtney Lee was going to play the way he did. Um, yeah. So I, I just don't think that they went into the season realistically thinking they would be where they were. And then same with the uh, team that went 43 and nine or 43 and 39 um, when they lost to the Atlanta Hawks. I think they knew that team was going to be good. I think that team was better than what they even intended. I think that team was better than even the players intended. I honestly, that team really would have just made the playoffs without going to the play in. Um, they they lost a lot of overtime games, and then a lot of times they played down to their competition. The, the, I, we've talked about it before, and if not, I've I know I've talked about it on a YouTube channel, but the team would go down 20 like it was nothing and come back from 20 like it was nothing, but sometimes they'll pull out the win. Sometimes they'll still lose, and it's like if y'all came out with urgency at the beginning of the game, I, I, I highly think, I, highly, I truly believe that you would have won that game. So, uh, you know, we easily could have went from 43 and 39 to 48 and quick map 34, 40 and 34. Yeah, that's not right. Uh, so we'll see. I, I think at the end of their tenure, however long their tenure is, you will look at them and no, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to count this year. And even next year, maybe might be too soon to really expect anything drastically changing, but I'm going to say that, I truly believe that at the end of their tenure, you will look at them and look at every season they were in charge and say, this team attempted to make the playoffs every year. I think I think you'll say that. Um, and I think that's a good thing. I, I mean, of course, there may be some rebuild years and that was a thunder. It is thunder in here. But I will say there are some rebuild years in there. Uh, for sure, if something were to happen, I, I you know, we're obviously not going to count those. But as long as the Miller ball is playing at a high level and we have some complimenting pieces such as Brandon Miller, such as Miles Bridges, such as Mark Williams, I think there's no reason to not try. So especially after this year, um, I think we I think we can safely look and say, OK, th- these guys are trying. I think they're going to do whatever they can to help put this team in a place to win. And I know that some people could, who defend Mitch Kupchak say that he's doing that now. Like, Oh, you know, he got Frank Neely key, but it's just, if you, I mean, if you really think about it is, it's just the bare minimum. It's like, okay, maybe he's making a team better, but is it really good enough? No, it does. Does he know that? Probably. You know what I mean? I think with gay Plock and rich and all the way they've been talking, I think at the end that, you will see real moves. You won't see these. The the free agency period is dead and we're just grabbing some guy and he actually ends up being pretty decent for us. And then we let him walk. Well, Dennis Smith Jr. turned it down, but still. I don't think you're going to see that under them. I think we're going to see more moves to help put the Hornets in the true position. So when the Hornets are, for example, kind of where they're in now, almost like limbo, where we don't really quite know how good they can be, but we know they're not bad. Uh, we know that they can really be a team that makes the playoffs. However, it's like uh, we're kind of in that, you know, that limbo spot. 
I think once the, the new owners get settled, we will see them actually try to do something to take the leap. Now, will it be a good decision? I don't know. That's where, you know, it it's easy to say it's, it's a good or bad decision in the moment, but then you really got to wait two to three years for these things to really be able to tell if it's a good or bad decision. Um, so that, that will be the tough part. But overall, I think we will see them really try and i'm and i'm glad you know hearing from what i heard from the press conference it does seem like they want to win it does seem like they know what winning would do for this franchise and as far as them being business people winning is going to bring you money and you, the team already makes a lot of money in general and then they're definitely made even more money with Lamelo ball now you're getting brandon miller in there despite you know the video of when he got drafted mark williams is in there the team just looks like a team that eventually could do something so you get the the backing of the fans behind that. You you put in an effort and really try to make some moves and not just these like cookie cutter moves. I think that we will have a decent product and I think that we will finally be the team we were in the 90s and 80s. And I can't wait. I, I really can't wait. I don't think we're going to be this powerhouse under them. I honestly just being completely honest, and this is just maybe the uh, pessimistic, pessimistic person I am, but. I don't think we're winning a championship under them, and I don't think even think it's them. I just don't. I just don't see it as of right now. I don't think it's going to happen in the next ten years. But I would love to be proven wrong. But I think we're going to be really close, and I think this is probably going to be the most successful period in Charlotte Hornets history. I will say that, and I can almost confidently say that. Um, but we'll see. This is just based on the press conference. I don't know these people. I have to, until they give me a reason to not believe them, I'm going to believe them. That That's just how it goes. And yes, I am skeptical. I'm skeptical of everyone, especially someone that's coming in and telling me that my franchise has been ter- terrible my whole life is finally going to be good. Yeah, it's hard to, for me to believe you, but I want to be optimistic. And y'all were saying all the right things. I really have no reason to not trust you as of right now. So, of course, I'm going to believe you and I'm going to back you. So that is what I'm doing. Now, we can talk about one of the first moves they made, which, well, I guess one of two of the first moves they made. The first one was cutting Xavier Sneed. Like, I, it's like they walked out to press conference and they cut Xavier Sneed. Well, shortly after, uh, a report came out that they signed Frank Neela Kina, the former New York Knick, uh, former Dallas Maverick. Uh, he was taken in, in the, with the eighth overall pick in the 2017 draft by the New York Knicks. And I remember when he came out because he was a guy with the size and everybody was like, he just needs to. He was, I mean, he was one of those prospects where everybody was saying, once he puts it together, he's going to be dangerous. But he was far off. Like, for example, I said that this year about Amin Thompson, and I still believe that. I think Amin Thompson could possibly be, be possibly be, the second best player in this draft if he puts it all together. Now, when you look at him in Thompson's game, he has almost all of it. Like he, The only thing he really needs to work on at nauseum is his shooting. But if he can put his shooting together, even to a decent clip, that guy's going to be a problem. I And I, and I believe that through and through. Frank Nielakina wasn't that way. Frank Nielakina, there was a lot of you know spots in his game where you were like, oh, I, I see the upside. Um, and once he puts it together, he'll be great. But there was a lot of pieces. It was like in a what a ten thousand piece. Uh, was it the clear, the transparent puzzle pieces? It was like one of that. It was like ten thousand pieces of transparent puzzle pieces, as opposed to we'll just use an example. I said Amin Thompson, who's a hundred pieces of a car, a hundred pieces, a hundred puzzle pieces of a car. It's a little bit easier. So, I mean, if anything, he, he is going to take the Dennis Smith Jr. Role. Um, I don't think he can run the offense the way Dennis Smith Jr. Did, did. I also don't believe that he can defend the perimeter the way Dennis Smith Jr. Did. I think the thing about Dennis Smith Jr. Is that one, he was athletic Two, He had this mentality, this dog mentality that made him so aggressive on the court, especially on the defensive end. And I think that that helped us a lot. Uh, I, you know, it, it was kind of, it kind of really sucked that we got such a good Dennis Smith Jr. Without our real team. And with LaMelo getting hurt, because I think you put Dennis Smith Jr. On that 43 and 39 team. And I hate to keep going back, but that's like, the last time we had everybody, you put Dennis Smith Jr. on that team. That, that's a problem, especially with what DSJ provided uh, defensively. Frank Elikina, it's more, but he's he's just 
and I'm not saying Dennis Smith wasn't a smart defender because I do believe with his athletic ability, with the, his dog mentality, with the tenacity he had. I need to find a new word. I use tenacity a lot, but with his just effort on playing defense. I mean, how many times players have said defense is a majority effort? With his effort, he played on defense. He was also a cerebral defender. He knew what he was doing on the defensive side of the ball. So I'm not saying he isn't, but what I am saying is that Frank Nielakina is more so a cerebral defender, a, a brains defender. He's more about the technique. He's more about uh, just kind of understanding. Maybe probably watch. He probably watched a lot of film and knows where guys are going to go. He's that kind of defender. He's not just a get up in your face. I'm going to just make you completely uncomfortable type of defender. I mean, because both work. I'm not mad at either or. But it seems like Frank Nielakina is just a more of a, a film watcher, more of a I'm going to deny you from your spot. I'm not just going to get up in your face. But I'm not I'm just going to just face guard you and just make it difficult for you to move. Um, And I know which I know you like going to your left. I know you like going, you know, over to whatever the case may be. I know, you know, you don't like using the screen when it's on your right. Th- those type of things. I think that's what Frank Nielakina, uh more so does, as well as uh, with his link. I think he knows how to use his body to kind of disrupt. The you know the passing lanes disrupt the pick and roll disrupt handoffs. I think that is kind of more of the defender he is now. I don't think is he's going to have the defensive numbers that Dennis Smith Jr. had. Well, like we're seeing all the stats now that Dennis Smith Jr. one of the best defenders, uh, perimeter defenders last year, which we all saw that. I think the rest of everybody else had to catch up. Also, he did miss a few games, so I, that that's part of it too. Why people probably didn't catch on, and then by the time he came back, the horns were kind of done, and people weren't watching him anymore but or at all they probably weren't watching him the whole season but yeah i think frank nilakina i I mean i think he's gonna be decent i I really wouldn't expect anything from him offense i hope that they didn't sign frank nilakina expecting him to do what dennis Smith jr did however if they just want him to play that role play similar basketball then yes i think we can we have that cover and i think he'll be able to do that um offensively like i said that is where it scares me the most um, and I can everybody is down. I'm trying to be a little more positive just because with our team, we're so offensively focused. I think it won't hurt to have a guy like him to kind of just really focus on defense. And I think it may help him if we're able to tell Frank Nielakina, hey, do not worry about offense. Yes, we want you to run the break. Yes, probably, you know, cut from the hash or cut from the corner, probably cut from the corner. Yes, we want you to do those things, but that is not your main concern. It, you know, don't try to force it. Shoot when you're open. We just need you to focus on defense. I think it's going to help him a lot. I think I think that will allow him to really, you know, play his role and not have to worry about doing other things. Um, and I think that will help us because we don't have anyone to really do that. We don't really have anyone to, hey, your role on this team is to be a perimeter defender. We don't need you to do anything else. Because even when Cody Martin comes back, now with Frank Nielakina being our backup point guard, from what it seems, we're going to need Cody Martin to kind of do a little more offense. He's going to also have to be a cutter. He's also going to have to be a playmaker, which he's an underrated playmaker, in my opinion. Um, and if they play mate by committee, I think that it can make up for the lack of playmaking Frank Nielakina has. Um, so I believe that we're in a good space here if we if we just have him focus on defense. But like I said, his offense, I completely understand why everybody's worried. I completely understand why everybody's like, this is a terrible pick because overall picking or not picking, but acquiring for, is that the right word? Don't, do they use they usually use acquiring for trades? Signing. We'll just say signing. I, I was trying to find a different word, but signing Frank Nielakina. There were other options out there. There were other guys I would rather have. However, um, if if used correctly, I think this can be a good thing. Uh, but I mean, I'm looking at his offensive numbers. First of all, he averaged three points a game with one, basically one rebound, one assist, shooting 36, 25, and 67 percent from the field, which is not good at all for the Dallas Mavericks last year in how many games? 47 games, averaging 13 minutes. Now I will go back and probably watch those games because. I actually liked Frank Nielakina coming out in that draft. I didn't think he was going to be this all-worldly player, but I did. 
I was hoping to see like a guy that can make some defensive teams. I, I that's kind of what I was hoping for him. And I, just, and, I all, and the thing is with me in the draft, I usually watch these guys. I'm so big into the draft. I usually watch these guys, you know, two years ahead before they even come into the draft. So I'm always rooting for everybody. So I always have a positive outlook because I don't want to see anyone fail. But the reality is not everybody's going to pan out. So I'm personally just thinking, I. I you know, I want to see him, you know, make some defensive teams, but obviously that did not happen. But I, w- I do want to watch the games. I do want to go back and watch his minutes because he's not more of a stat person. He's more of a, you know, watch what he does. Does does he switch? Does he switch well? What type of players can he guard? What type of players can he guard? Those are things I would like to know. And I actually we might actually come back and do a big uh, a breakdown of that. For him, uh, because actually, I will do that. I promise you, I will do that. I will create, I will um, record a breakdown of Frank Nealakina, and I'll put it on a YouTube channel. So make sure you go ahead and subscribe, or just even just pay attention and look me up. Trust the buzz on YouTube, and I'll have that breakdown. We'll do a film breakdown of Frank Nealakina and his possessions last year, and maybe if we can, maybe some stuff that he did in New York as well, because I think his rookie year is probably one of his best years. Um, let's see, his rookie year, Frank Nealakina averaged. What six three and two, so I mean that's pretty decent. He still shot terribly, but it is he's shot terribly his whole career. I want to see actually what kind of shots he's taking to make him shoot so bad. But we'll get into that in the film review. So make sure you go ahead and subscribe to the YouTube channel for that. And also, I'll just upload the audio to all the podcast platforms as well. If you have, if you just don't feel like going to YouTube or you're not a YouTube person. Perfectly fine. I mean that that's what I'm here to do is provide content for you in the best way I can. But looking at basketball reference, uh, they do have a good indicate. I'm trying to find it. They do have a good indication of ah by distance. So they have percentage of field goal attempts by distance. So he attempts 49% of his shot attempts are two pointers. So a little under half. And let's see. Uh, Basically, 14% are at the rim, so he doesn't get to the rim that much. 16% are kind of between 3 and 10 feet, and then after that, it falls off. And then he has basically 51% of his attempts are at 3. Now, considering he doesn't shoot the 3 well, I think that also is what hurt his percentage so much. But if we are looking at field goal percentage by distance, so this is understanding what he scores, the percentage of field goals he scores, uh, by distance. Did I say that right? I'm pretty sure I did. I could have said it wrong. But what I like about the podcast, and this is irrelevant to Frank Nealakina, but what I like about podcasting is I can mess up and keep going. Y'all understand. It's a podcast. I'm here to talk. Y'all want to hear me talk. I hope so. And so I, I like that you, you're just patient with me. I, I really appreciate that. It, may, it makes me feel special. But anyway, field goal percentage by distance. So uh, it, his two point is he shoots 47% from the field. So what it looks like off without looking at the stats or not, not the stats, but without looking at what he does. Um, okay. My, my iPad froze, but without looking at the film, I think that the reason he shoots so poorly, he's taking too many threes. You shoot 50, you shoot 51% of your shots are threes. And yet you shoot 25% from three. So maybe stop shooting so many threes. Right. That, I mean, that's what it looks like. What's crazy. Never mind. It doesn't even matter. I was going to say what's crazy is that he shoots 77 percent from 16 feet, you know, plus up until the three point range. But he literally only takes like is that like nine percent of those? Yeah. Nine percent of his field goal attempts are of those. So that doesn't count. So, yeah, he finishes at the rim at a high rate, 50, 57% last year. Last year, uh, really 58%. He made 58% of his shots at the rim. Then it falls off uh, between the 3 to 10 feet range. He shoots only 29%, um, and that, that looks like about a career average for him, so that makes sense. Or not 29%, 24%, I'm sorry. Um, and then the 10 to 16 feet he shoots 42, roughly, 42% from the field, from 10 to 16 feet. But he only takes, looking at it real quick, yeah, he's, he doesn't take many at all. 
you know what, four, 14% of his field goal attempts are between that three to 10 feet range. Or am I looking at? No. What am I looking at? I didn't mess it up. I'm trying to look at the numbers and I and I'm I am muffing it up. No. Okay, yeah. So only nine percent of his field goal attempts are um from the ten to sixteen per, uh feet range. So yeah, it's it's not much at all. They need to, it's not they need to do it better, but I'm just I need to zoom in because I'm zoomed out so much that I'm mixing up the numbers. Yeah, so roughly he uh ten to sixteen feet. He only takes 9%. 9% of his shots come from 10 to 16 feet, but he shoots at a high clip for those. Uh, 42%. Yeah, so it seems like he just needs to stop shooting threes. I think that will make his percentage go up. Uh, more than half your shots at threes, and you don't make them. So stop doing it. I think that that's what it comes down to. In the corner, he shoots 13. He shot 13% from three from the corner, which is the lowest in his career last year. Um. And also 34% of his three-point attempts came from the corners. And they just he just didn't hit them. But I will say that is a low for him. Uh, looking at it, uh, the lowest before that was his sophomore year where he shot 25% from the corners. But other than that, his rookie year, he shot 38% from the corner. Um, his In his third year, he shot 48% from the corner. Um, and then in his last year in New York, where he played 33 games, he shot 71% from the corner. And then um, two years ago for Dallas, he shot 34% from the corner. So if we can get that, uh, I wouldn't even say the 48% because of the 48% from the corner, he only shot 18% of his threes in the corner. So really, I mean, I guess we can just base it off. Two years ago in Dallas, when he shot 32% of his threes in the corner, he shot 34%. I will take that. I will take that if you can add me some defensive viability, which I think he can. He can probably guard one through three. Let's see. Last year, he last year he guarded 17% of the time he was guarding point guards, 59% of the time he was guarding shooting guards, which I think is a good thing because who on our team is really – able to guard shooting guard we have Bryce McGowan's uh we know Terry Rozier he's been guarding up but that's just unfair to him it makes him look like he's a bad defender when I actually don't think he is it's just he's always guarding someone he doesn't need to be guarding and then James Booknight of course doesn't need to be guarding anybody I mean he's better than I thought but he doesn't need to be guarding anybody Cody Martin will be back so maybe that will change some stuff as well uh and then 24% of the time he was guarding small forwards and in 1% of the time he was guarding power forwards so on the court, um, plus minus, he was what? Plus 5.9 on a, per 100 possessions on plus minus. Not bad, not bad when he was on the court. Um, but then when he was off the court, the team was below 6.7. But I think that's because of scoring. I, it has to be because of scoring. Um, I, I per, Yeah, that's probably because of scoring. So, yeah, I mean, Frank Nielakina going to be very interesting. I, I really don't see it. I, I see the idea. I just don't know if it will work. Dennis Smith Jr., I was confident that if Dennis Smith Jr. was anything similar to what he was when he was in Dallas, that it, it would work out. I, I was very confident. I didn't think he was going to be the great defender that he was, but I did think that it was going to help the team in some capacity. I'm unsure with Frank the Tank. I'm completely unsure. Is that even – can you even use that? No, his nicknames, according to Basketball Reference, Frank Nathan's nicknames is Frankie Smoke, which I actually like that. The French eyes don't like that one. And the French Prince. I'm going to go with Frankie Smokes. We're calling him Frankie Smokes. And yeah, so interested to see what happens there. Um, Next is RJ Hunter. There's literally nothing to talk about RJ Hunter. I mean, I really don't even want to look this up because I've already looked it up. I don't, I don't think there's really anything to talk about. I think it's just a G League filler. If anything, maybe a camp, a training camp signing. But last time he even played in the NBA was the 2018-2019 season where he played one game for the Boston Celtics. Now, he did drop 17, but that was it. Before that, uh, he played a total of was it eight, 44 games. 
He's played 45 games in his NBA career, only started one that coming forward. He started a game for the Houston Rockets in 2017, 2018. Um, his career high on points playing more than 10 games. Well, he's never played more than 10 games outside of his rookie year, which I believe he was in the same draft class as Terry Rozier, if I'm not mistaken. I don't feel like looking at it. You know, I'm looking up now. Now now we have to deal with me looking this up because I wanted to know. I think him and Terry Rozier were drafted in the same class. Yes, they were. Terry was here. Boston Celtics was drafted 16th overall. And RJ Hunter for the Boston Celtics was drafted 28th overall. And yeah. So he hasn't been good since he left Georgia State. And Georgia State went on that run. Uh, I say run. They beat Baylor, who was a good dude, was like a two seed, or maybe they were a three seed, but they beat Baylor. And then they almost beat Xavier in the second round, but they lost. Um, so yeah, I say run, but not really. And that tournament really helped him <laughs> get into the first round just because he was playing so good. I, yeah, there's really nothing to say. I mean, he's supposed to be like this catch and shoot sharpshooter. I know he kind of played point guard at Georgia State. Did he play? I'm pretty sure he played like some type of point guard at Georgia State. Either way, um, I just don't think that really there was anything uh, for him to really do for the Charlotte Hornets. I think I think this is just a camp sign. I wouldn't think any more of it. Uh, but yeah, now I've talked for 35 minutes as a solo pod. This solo podcasting thing is a little difficult just because it is just me talking. And when I talk to other people, like I might bring my guy Tyler on here. If you uh, follow me or are subscribed to me on YouTube, you've heard me talk to Tyler before. He's, he's always a good, um, co-host, a guest. I don't know what to call him, but he's always a good person to talk hoops with. I love talking to Tyler. He's just busy. He's in school and stuff. He's young. So I don't really get to uh, get, you know, he's he's always busy, but definitely would like to get him on. There's a, a few other people I would like to get on um, as well. Balta from uh, Hive Hoops. Definitely would like him on. James Plowright from All Hornet. There's a lot of people. Um, my guy Terry from Buzz Boys. I would actually like to get him on here. There's a lot of people I want to talk Charlotte Hornets with. So I'll definitely be bringing that to the podcast. And um also, when the season's getting closer to start, I'll be doing like a like a division breakdown. I have two good buddies of mine. Uh, one's a Miami Heat fan, one's an Atlanta Hawk fan. So I'll have them on, and we could talk the division. I think that'll be a fun episode uh, instead of doing it separately. And I'll, I'll probably do my own as well, but I definitely will have do an episode where I bring them on and just kind of hear their thoughts on what they'll say um we, you know they always talk j- junk in our group chat but i think when it comes to really like really talk about hoops they'll give their real honest opinion of the charlotte hornets i know that we'll you know they'll have their jokes of course because we are the joke of the nba right now especially with the kings um finally making the playoffs and probably going to make the playoffs again this upcoming season but yeah it's going to be fun i have a lot of content playing i plan also plan i vow to get better at this podcasting thing um i really don't feel like i I uh, had the chops for it yet. It's it's tough to kind of talk to yourself for so long and there's no edits, there's no layovers, there's no any or overlays rather. There's none of that uh, as opposed to when I do a YouTube video, of course, I can make it look as clean as possible. There's not the mishaps and all that. So I try to get the podcast more raw and uncut just because you can hear my actual thoughts and we can ramble. But let me know. Just let me know wherever you listen to the podcast. Make sure you leave a uh, the leave a five-star review if you do like the podcast and make sure you leave a comment of anything i can improve on you can always reach me on twitter at trust buzz t-r-u-z-z b-u-z-z i talk anything charlotte hornets carolina panthers carolina hurricanes unc tar hills duke sometimes i I hate duke but you know we we could look i just because i hate duke don't mean i hate you if you like duke i don't just automatically hate you now it kind of depends some of y'all be annoying but you get the point um yeah, so just let me know. I, I want to provide the best content literally possible I can for y'all podcast form. Thank you to Believe for just having me on, you know, as the host. And yeah, we're, I'm, I'm thinking about bringing some segments and stuff. I know that y'all, a lot of y'all like the news. I try not to get too gimmicky. I don't want to do like, oh, guess this and do this and let's do that. Unless y'all want me to. If y'all want me to bring, you know, some segments on here, I'll be glad to. But what I want to do is bring y'all news, bring y'all analysis, bring y'all breakdowns. So let me know what you think. I, I, I'm not opposed to it. I just didn't want to do it and no one would like it uh, because I know sometimes podcasts, when you, too many segments, it's like, OK, we're losing the analysis here. Um, but for sure, I, I'll look to bring on some type of um 
I, I'm keep saying I keep wanting to say game, but I'll I'll look for some type of segments to bring uh, for the Charlotte Hornets, and we'll continue to go from there. But thank you so much for listening, and I'll talk to you guys next time. Peace.